right. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Verdigree table. We've got Matt with us to answer D20 questions. The best Matt is here. Tell the fine folks at home <laughs> where they can find you on the internet and what they'll find if they go looking. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I am Matt Best, hence the pun. Uh, you can find me over on the Tales of Initiative live stream network. We have a bunch of different actual plays that run throughout the week. You can find us over on Twitch, Tales underscore of underscore initiative. Uh, you can find me GMing on Mondays. I run a 5e uh, horror adventure using Tales from the Awning portal as the basis, but with a continuous thread that kind of connects all the dungeons and adds some cosmic and gothic horror on there. So if that's your jam, we got you. I also play on Wednesdays, and we've got a brand new show on Tuesdays where we go around all different kinds of indie RPGs. Uh, you can also find the content that I make over at day20.org. I am TTRPG writer, publisher, designer. You can find a bunch of 5e stuff and a bunch of non-5e stuff, including like uh, a one-page RPG called Slime Time, where you get to play as little oozes moving around a dungeon and eating stuff. I love it. One pa one pagers have like a special place in my in my heart. They're very um, cool. Yeah. And I think that touches on so links links down below to all that stuff because no nobody knows how to type anymore. Um, check out the description <laughs> for for things to click on or just put, put tap a screen. Um, you, I mean, one, it's it's a it's a whole squad over there. You guys are bringing a a, a variety sampler pack of awesome content. Um, and I find there's a, there's there's a not to be too unkind, but there's some there's a lot of actual plays out there that are taking themselves very seriously mm -hmm. um and in the best possible way you guys don't <laughs> like you we... you are focused on fun over there i mean there's like serious beats and yes. moments and, but like you guys are having a, a a good infectiously fun time over there it's so much fun and like i love our i love our cast i love our crews we we very much like we talk about some. I have cried multiple times on stream on Wednesdays. We have gotten into some serious topics. We've gotten into things that are emotional and brutal and hard. And then three seconds later, we'll make a silly, you know, pee pee dick joke. Like it's, it's just like we're cutting up. We're friends at the table more than just like no. We have to be serious actors. Like the game, the game can be serious, but the game should also always be a game and be fun. And it, it took me some time. Like beginner dungeon master Ryan didn't know how if you build dramatic tension someone's gonna crack a joke to relieve it and that doesn't mean that you're failing to maintain a tone that mm -hmm. means you're doing your job and people yes. are sweating and having yeah. feelings there and was like, laughing and crying are are very close in your in your lizard brain oh absolutely and like i i think a good table will know when to crack the tension and when not to crack the tension. Uh, I know there's been several times where I'll, I'll pick on Haley, one of the the one of my co-players on Wednesdays and one of the players in my Monday game. There's been times where like I get her in a way that she has to kind of crack up to like as like defense mechanism, <laughs> like in a in a very like kind way. I mean that where it's just like Haley is reacting because you got me, and so hold on, let me get back into character. But like those moments are those moments are cool, and I think it's nice to kind of for audiences to be able to peek behind the curtain and see, oh, these are real humans doing real human things. Yes, yes. And it is evident that, like, there's a lot of uh, trust and just relation. You guys are friends. You guys are friends, and that comes yeah. through. Mm -hmm. um, there's relationships established there, and you're you're having a good time, and that lets us in to have a good time. Uh, yeah, man. And, like, humor is also my defense mechanism, so I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank you so much for saying all that. I really, I really appreciate it. I'm glad you like what you're seeing. We've got more stuff coming. I'm super excited. Check them out. Um, let's let's get into let's get into this show. Let's laugh. Yeah. Let's I don't know if we'll cry, but I, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, hey, we'll get there. Roll, roll a d20. <laughs> oh, and roll. we're gonna we're gonna ask some questions. If you get doubles, we do a lightning round. Ooh, okay. I haven't had a lightning like round that. in a minute, so. Uh, if it, if they're, I will roll, you will get to see how bad I am at rolling. That's a four to start us off with. Well, okay. There's no, there's no good or bad so much as, uh, there is a tonal shift between like lower numbers and higher numbers. Ooh. Okay. Um, this isn't bad. Uh, what motivated you to, to start making videos? Like what's your, your, your approach, your big idea and, or, you know, the origin story. Sure. Uh, lightning round of origin story for like 
I got into this wanting to be a publisher, a writer, like a written word creator. So I got a lot of my start writing adventures, writing modules. Uh, a big goal I had was I ran a home game that went from level one to 20 in D&D. And I wanted more people to get to see the scope of the game like that. So I was writing a lot of adventures, adventures that have what I call the dynamic challenge system. You can run the adventures I write for levels one and level 20. They, mm -hmm. they automatically scale up. It changes the numbers and the stat blocks. So that was where I was getting my start. And then there was, I've gotten with a lot of communities that were doing play by post. This was during COVID. So like the only way to really play was like through Discord. So I got into doing a lot of that because I wanted to play more. And then through the people I met, I met, uh, I interviewed, uh, auditioned for Tales of Initiative. And originally I was just going to be like a behind the scenes character, like helping to write stuff, helping to like provide materials. Like it was going to be a way for like, I could sponsor the stream and make sure that like they were getting cool stuff that they could use. And eventually I was like, you know what? I'd like to play. Sure. Let's do Let's do this. And it was just a blast and, you know, never, never looked back. Uh, and that has branched into a little bit more of my like on camera confidence. I do more TikToks now. I give jamming advice and game design advice over there on my personal channel. I do more stuff for Tales. I'm not just, you know, cast member, I'm editor, I'm coordinator, event coordinator, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that was that's the the through line is originally I wanted just a place for my my written stories to find like a cool audience. Uh, but now I'm just like enjoying the journey in in all the ways it's taking me. I love that. And that parallels kind of my, like, I want to make cool D and D stuff and I need to tell people about it. I guess I'll get a camera. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yep. No better hype man than yourself. Pretty, well, well, jury's still out on that one, but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, the, the dearth of, I mean, one high level content and two like adaptable content. Um, is a, is a, is a is a gap worth filling? Like I think a lot of people hear that and are like, oh yeah, I would love to go to twenty. And like, here's one secret: if you want to get to level twenty, start start at fifteen, sixteen. <laughs> it can help for sure. Make like a two year plan because mm -hmm. life happens. I um so a little bit a little bit of the deep cut into the history of like the day twenty brand. The reason it's called day twenty is that we had this idea for like, and I still at some point might do this. I'm drifting away from five e you know, just with everything that's happening. And like, I found a lot of like really cool success over in the indie RPG side. Um, but if I ever get around to it, once I get enough adventures out there in 5e land, I want to make a campaign guide that gives you rules for uh, running a campaign levels one to 20. And the whole premise of like how you get there better, every long rest, you level up. Mm. And the whole idea is that there's 20 days until an apocalypse happens. And you got to figure out as much as you can before it shows up and be ready to deal with it. I, I love that. There's so little attention paid to like, like the time element, mm -hmm. like is a knob that you can turn and the, and the rest mechanic is, is kind of your lever to changing that. Yeah. But like, I like turning it down. Like I, I like low level Lord of the Rings, -y exploration mm -hmm. based wilderness stuff. Um, but I also like variety. So like crank that thing to the, to 11 <laughs> yeah and then, like that's a cool concept i like that a lot yeah the idea was to give people an easy hook an easy like in narrative justification for like how why you're so quickly advancing through the levels is that you do not have time to mess about and like the gods your patrons whoever are like giving you that little extra juice to like hurry up before everything goes bust and that was also why we wanted the adventures to like be able to be tailored up is so that like, oh, they leveled up to five in the middle of the dungeon. Oh, this is going to break all the encounters. Nope, just change the level. Just boop. There you go. Just math. <laughs> yeah, just math. Just <laughs> math. We got it. We figured this out. Um, I love that. Okay, cool. I want I want to play all of your things now. Um, give me give me another uh, D20, please. And thank you. D20 coming up. <laughs> five. We're going oh, okay, in order. Well, I mean, it's, it's, go, it's a direction. Um. What is your favorite world building detail? And that could be general or specific. And it could be yours. It could be somebody else's. But a favorite world building detail. Ooh. Oh, that's fun. Favorite world building detail. Um, it, there's a cop out answer here, which is I love I love the details that the GM loves. I love because like when you see people that are world building, 
everyone has different things that they're fascinating with. Like somebody's like, I want to figure out like the guild structure. I want to figure out the politics of this place. And other people are like, I want to figure out the moon cycles. And I want to figure out what the cosmology and the planets and the orbs are. Uh, everyone has different things. So I like, I just like seeing people joyful about the lore they made. Um, that is a lot of fun. I will say, I will, I will selfishly say that my favorite world building detail for me was I love Terry Pratchett. I wanted to do a disc world for my own. So the world is flat. And I was like, okay, what does that do to the cosmology? Like, does it even make sense for there to be sunrises and sunsets? So what I did is that originally in my game, the sun and moon were just the same hole in the sky. They were just a window to other places. And so the seasons went in yearly cycles based on which inner plane, which one of the elemental planes was closest. And that was what the sun looked like. So during winter, the sun had a blue haze to it and it was cold because you were aligned with, uh, I think, elemental plane of water. And then it would rotate. Like once you got to, to elemental plane of fire, it would be a, a big red sun and it would be, it'd be hot outside. Um, the, the end of my home campaign actually changed that cosmology a bit because the the villain eclipsed the sun like blocked that hole in the sky and ended up bringing like an eldritch moon into its slot so now there is just an undead moon literally the corpse of a god sitting in the sky uh all the time day or night and then that window to the plains is like broken and tattered you can see it sort of like looking ugly in the sky um and that is the that is the world that we have for our monday campaign so if you want to know more about why that moon is so haunted go check us out Moon's haunted. Uh, Can I just yep. interject? Um, yeah. Dope. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like when the like I liked making the celestial bodies metaphysical as much as they were physical. So that was that was just a that was where I got a lot of joy building the lore of my world and coming up with like and the idea is like the flat plane. Like when you get to the quote unquote edge of the world. I always love that. I love that scene from Pirates of the Caribbean over over the edge and back again. Like I love that kind of stuff where like the map is metaphysical. I love that. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to the edges, when you get to the unknown fuzzy spaces on the map, that's when you start leaning into other planes and you start going into the weird and the wild more so than just your classic like points of light D&D &D setting. Yeah, I, I, I'm a, a big Discworld guy. I've only read, you know, a few dozen of them. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not a true fan. <laughs> I think, uh, what was it, Mort? Is it either Mort or Morty? I think I might be getting Rick and Morty Mort is the, is the kid who becomes Mort. death. Yeah. God, that book hooked me. That book <laughs> That book still has its its teeth in me. I love that story so much. I like going post. I like the the bureaucratic, the city ones, but like the the weird, like the small gods. They're soft. Yes. Like, well, Terry Patch is amazing. Go check them out if you haven't already. Incredible. Um, it's very intimidating because there's 80 some odd books, but there's like yeah. charts. Like there's like a bunch of different endpoints. You don't have to read it sequentially. And pick, honestly, pick one up. It's great. Pick at random. Roll a dice. Like they're all so good. And yes. I think any sense of continuity is 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 much lower priority than just enjoying the story that's there. Fantastic author. Really great yes. stories. Yes. And you can just like you can tear through it and read it very quickly. And it'll stop you. It's just like that is a terrible, brilliant pun mm -hmm. that has like so many layers of social commentary. <laughs> and it's the, such the, a dumb smart joke and like that's my that's my exactly you nailed it it's like the the density of humor and yeah. and like sort of like a topicalness that he gets in his words it's it's unbeatable i've never seen anyone else do it so well it's 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 poetry it's monty python poetry it's uh -huh. such a weird yes um but I want to I want to circle back to what you called your cop out answer of like you like what the dm is like clearly excited about like you like engaging with like like that, uh, that, that's incredible. I mean, that that's 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 the kind of players I want at my table, right? That's that's someone who's run the game, who's playing with other people, who like, oh, there's there's you've mentioned tied tables three times. Like, I'm going to engage with. That. I'm going to push yeah. that button because like coolness is going to come out. <laughs> like something. Mm -hmm. Like you were clearly you've thought about this. You put work into this. I bet it's, I bet if I pull on this thread, it's connected to other cool things. Yeah. Um, and the dungeon master is also a player and is there to have a good time. And if you want them to continue to run the game for you, yeah. maybe try to contribute to their enjoyment. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't think that's a cop out answer at all. I think that's an incredible answer. The, the whole to another plane being the sun 
Yeah, also a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think that, like you said, GM is also a player. And I think so much, it's so it's an interesting seat because so much of your play is passive. It's mm. doing that sort of like social bidding. It's like, here's a thing I'm interested in. And you just wait to see if anyone else wants to be interested in it. So yeah. Yeah. when you're when you're a player, there's a bleeding into player advice and you see your GM bid, call like answer that bid like go, go ahead and call that like go reach out and like oh you've like you said mentioned tide tables what if i what if my you know what if i made like a sea elf character or what if i leaned into like some aquatic nature in my vibe like what could i pull there what what about it is what about it is interesting you and how can i help bleed that out through my character and i like how you're like creeping into to poker terminology slowly just like <laughs> yeah buy in yeah i'm like raise like mm -hmm. if you check nothing yes. happens nothing yeah. ha right uh, like maybe maybe somebody else raises the stakes right maybe somebody mm -hmm. else buys in th this is in your hand cool right make room for other people but like damn if you if you fold <laughs> if you fold yeah. three times then like it's going to be a much less interesting game and i mean in an actual play scenario forget about it but just in your home game for sure if you don't if you don't engage with what the what has been prepared mm-hmm it's it's probably going to be. I mean, people are out there running per, pure in, in, improvised games, but like, it's often yeah. not as good. <laughs> yeah, That's or something someone's thought about. It can be as good, but you really need to practice those improv muscles. And like, improv GM talks about this all the time: is that when your scene partners give you something, respect what they gave you and answer it back, and don't don't dismiss it, don't sideways it, don't dodge it. Take it and amp it up. So that's that's really at the heart of yes and. Yes and doesn't mean you literally say yes and. Yes and means I'm taking what you gave me and I'm going to build off of it. Exactly. And you, yeah, and if you're not going to, you need to be masterful of that if you're not going to buy the premise. But if, but if you fail to buy right. the premise, you're already... Yeah, you're... you're this is already lost. off the rails. Yeah. It's gone. Uh, all right, give me, a, give me a D20. Yeah, is it going to be a six? Let's see. It's a one. It's a one. Um, boom. I roll such trash. This is point. Well, it's good. It's good for a dungeon master. Um, what aspect of running the game are you currently focused on? Which is a, a polite way of saying what do you have like room to improve? Oh, interesting. I was I was gonna answer that a different way. I just spent all of yesterday prepping a dungeon. Um, I mean, I'll take I'll take two answers. But, but uh, what do I need to focus? What am I focused on the most? I think what I'm focused on the most is um something i've not been good at before is the improv level the unpreparedness level uh so a lot of what i've uh, i am a prep heavy gm i typically go into a session with pages of notes and like every npc that is likely to come up you know even if i think oh well a random npc might come up here i still have like some like filler notes in there like get ready to like backfill that character Something that I've been leaning in a lot more into ever since I started uh, running Thirsty Sword Lesbians and Cyborg spe specifically are my improv muscles. Doing a lot more like, I don't know what's going to happen in this scene, and I'm okay with that. I'm going to give a premise, and I'm going to let my players respond, and then I'll and then we're just in an improv scene now. And we're just back and forth, and we're, we're, we're bobbing and weaving, we're zigging and zagging. So that's something that I've been focused on getting better at because it's outside of my usual DM prep comfort zone. Well, it's a very uh, challenging place to be. You almost have to be comfortable in the discomfort. A lot mm -hmm. of us, you know, preparation feels, even if you're going to throw it out, <laughs> and yeah. it feels, yeah. it feels like, okay, I'm doing something. I'm re I, it, it's, it prepares you to feel ready. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and you do enough of that, then like, you know, that, that, that is also building those improv muscles in a, in a way you're building a reservoir of moves and characters and tropes. Um, but it does feel like playing without a net. And it's interesting that like, yeah, it, some systems lend themselves to that or like demand it, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good, it's good exercise, even if that's not your preferred place to live. I don't care how much you prep, eventually something's going to come up and you're like, this is not in the notes. <laughs> this is absolutely. In the book. Yeah. And I would say if you are a GM that wants to get better at that, play a Powered by the Apocalypse system. Um, and when you play it, be willing to ask questions and not have answers. So for example, if I was playing Thirsty Sword Lesbians and somebody rolled a downbeat and I didn't have a downbeat prep, like usually I'm prepping a couple of downbeats that I think might happen. If I don't think any of those are going to really apply, I might ask the player, 
what's the worst thing that you think could happen in this scenario? And even if I don't exactly do that, I now have an anchor point to base whatever I am going to do off of it. So I might be like, that is bad. It's not going to be that bad, but it's going to get close. And here's what happens. So I'm letting the player tell me, because so much of those games, we get into this bad habit of thinking the GM needs all the answers. And so much of those games are focused on letting the players provide about 80% of the answers. And you're just there to bumper pool them in really interesting, dramatic ways. God, yeah. Because like out of the gate, everyone's like, yes, this is a this is a practice and collaborative st storytelling. And I'm in charge of the story and have to make up all of it by myself. Yep. Yep. And we put that burden on ourselves and then you never do it. Right. You always feel like oh, I have to prep. Or I have to prep. Or I never get good at the improv. Um, yeah. Eschew that burden. Let be be uh, trust your players enough to let them see you don't know. Mm. and that you're allowing them to fill that space and then you're going to run with it because when you do that now ever everyone's engaged because it's even if something bad happens i as a player am like that bad thing happened but i picked that bad thing that was a bad thing that i had like story investment in and i love i'm still getting the story i want even if it's bad for my character the the devil's bargain yeah and like there's different that's the perfect charm for it there's different titles for that move but like that's that you get player buy in in like a bad so they're not gonna try to negotiate their way out of it like wait a minute i have can, can i get advantage yeah. or inspiration yeah they they will start yes ending the downward spiral yes yeah it'll it'll teach players to want bad but narratively interesting things to happen to their characters so that you have dark moments to contrast against the light moments and that's that's advanced level play wherever you're sitting at the table that's that's the good shit you're not trying to win you're not trying to get big number good like yeah it's part of it it feels good mm -hmm. but if you can't if you can't lose then you're not winning <laughs> exactly yes you need you need that the the, the dichotomy of, of results to make the stakes matter you gotta have dark to show the light bob ross taught us that yep um give me, <laughs> give me a d20 <laughs> i could retire right now i got a bob ross reference right <laughs> you got a bob ross reference nailed it thanks everybody uh, good night hey i found the six <laughs> you were not joking are you rolling is this is this the same set it's of the dice same or? it's the same, same dice. okay yeah um what is something that you've learned slash stolen uh from another dungeon master oh oh that's good um i could go real easy and say from matt colville i have learned if you like it put it in your game just be just be absolutely brazen and unabashed about it. Who cares? We're all stealing. We're on the shoulders of giants. Stop messing around and just put it in your game. Um, I, I Not to just keep talking about my campaign, but like my Tales of Tales campaign, the primary plot is based around Naruto. I love like the main plot of OG Naruto and like Naruto Chippuden. And I was like, this is great. I could totally see this fitting in my cosmology. I could totally see this being a really cool, like, moral quandary for my party leading up to it. So yeah, it's that plot. If you if you haven't already figured it out, like we've literally mentioned tailed beasts uh, on the show numerous times. Like if you're not seeing it already, uh, slight spoiler alert. We're doing we're doing moderate stuff. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is very sound advice. So many people drive themselves mad trying to reinvent the wheel. And like, if no one's done it before, mm -hmm. they probably have. You just didn't hear about it because it was not great. Uh. And, to, and to that point, there's been numerous times where I have like prepped a session like or prepped a plot point. We did it. It was super fun. And then one of my players goes like, did you get that from? Fill in thing I've never, ever heard of. Yeah. And like uh, uh, human brains. They are amazing. They are mystical, but we are all converging on like different thoughts and different archetypes that we've all shared at some point. That's, I mean, that's why we'll talk about it next time, but that's why archetypes is the word here. Like you can get real deep into like the Jungian, mm -hmm. the collective unconscious with it, yep. which I'm happy to, but like <laughs> you, there's only so many things, right? Like, oh, that this obscure anime that you like, it's fucking Shakespeare. And he stole yep. it from some guy that is you can't find anymore <laughs> that we've forgotten because we've lost that manuscript but we got plenty of shit yeah and like don't and i will watch a hundred adaptations of the same shakespeare play yeah. because the interesting thing is the choices that get made within that narrative structure mm -hmm. the slight details the little bits of variation which is 
kind of why I'm addicted to TTRPGs at this point. I love that the dice are part of the storytelling mm. because it means that while you are leaning on those familiar archetypes, they are never guaranteed to fulfill themselves. And there is such dramatic tension and amazingness that could happen in those in those breaks. Ah, yeah, because you need, again, it's that contrast. Like you need those expectations mm -hmm. of like whatever narrative trope or straight up plot line there for them to be satisfying when they're met and to have that tension of like the question mark i don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. actually kind of low stakes like nihilism at a certain point yeah whereas like i have an expectation of what's going to happen how how are we going to get there and are we going to get there yeah way more exciting and interesting you look at game of thrones i i imagine that part of the success of game of thrones wasn't just that it was a well-produced well-shot hbo show it was based on a narrative that looked at you in the face and said, I'm going to kill characters you care about. No one has plot armor. Get ready for it. And people got addicted to that. They wanted yes. that because that's not a kind of story that we get to see very often. Yeah. Yes. Fuck. How is your character? Okay. Game of Thrones, perfect example, right? Like, how is how is your ttrpg character especially a D, D like 5e character how are they going how is that story going to finish one are you are you are you going all in on the fact that this game group is going to be cohesive for two to three years and we're mm -hmm. going to hit level 20 um and have a satisfying conclusion or are they going to go out in a blaze of glory are they going to die and be remembered and just like sear their way into everybody's memories like ned stark yeah. and 100 characters the red wedding like or is it going to kind of like not stick the landing and everyone's gonna hate it. <laughs> <laughs> or and i would even say uh in the context of certainly players and to a certain extent gms don't have an ending in mind no. if you want if you want at least engage with the choose your own adventure idea and have multiple ideas of play like for me for my characters i like if things go well i see them ending up in kind of this spot if things go bad i see them ending up in kind of this spot if things go mediocre i could see them kind of leave your endings so nebulous that you allow the ttrpg format to really thrive which is if you have an ending in mind go write that book we all we're almost at november uh, I'm not going to use the the that name, but it's, go write fifty thousand words in a month. No, you can use uh, that name. There's a there's a mug behind me. It's covered up by Ecto One now, but there, oh, there's nice. an Animal mug behind me. November's I coming, gang. I wasn't going to invoke the name because they recently came out positive towards like AI writing, so I was like, eh. but, oh no, uh, are they problematic? They I, they I can't reference anything anymore. I know, I know. They've recently talked about like they're going to allow like programmatically generated writing into their contest which very much sort of defeats the point right your face is correct uh but that's we can drop it there i was just gonna say if you have an ending in mind if you know where you want this story to go write that book we're gonna love that book don't tell it an rpg because the dice will frustrate you you will be in tension with everything that role-playing games are designed to do the whole time whereas if you leave that ending open even from the gm side uh you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of fun you're gonna leave you you the the dice will be your George R. R. Martin, and you'll never know when he's coming to kill your precious baby. And that's the the fun. That's the game element of it all. And like that, that's the the sense of discovery. Mm -hmm. Like when things, even like as the dungeon master, that's some of my favorite. That's why I so, I'm so into tables, right? Like I utilize the dice and incorporate what the players are doing so that I can be surprised. <laughs> like it's not like the oh, I built this world and it just did this thing I didn't expect it to do. Like, mm -hmm. that's that's the like the real world magic for me. That's, that's the, the magic moment, for sure. Um. Okay. I'm going to ask you to roll, I guess, a two? I got a two and a three. <laughs> we got two and three. <laughs> we're going for that straight. That six high straight. <laughs> yeah. Nope, we're going back to five. So lightning round? Uh, oh, yes. All right, cool. Um. So again, it's all a flimsy premise. Uh, you don't have to answer yes or no. We can... <laughs> Get into the weeds with these, but out of the gate, hard hitting questions. Do you fudge? Uh, every time I have fudged, I've hated it afterwards. So I now have a no fudge policy. Interesting. Good answer. Um, what is your favorite die size? I'm going to clarify this. Not D12. your favorite. I, what's that? D12. That's every, the most. I mean, I've really loved getting to connect with awesome creative people like yourself. Um, I think the most deeply satisfying and gratifying element of this 
project of D20 questions has been the confirmation that D12 is pretty much everybody's favorite. Mm -hmm. It's so underused. It's, it's underutilized. Which is, yeah. Uh, like which is shape. why for slime time, I made it a D12 system. Good. Thank you. You're, you're doing, welcome. You're doing the Lord's work out there. Um, <laughs> I think I know the answer to this, but uh, publish your homebrew. Oh, uh, both. They're, they are not they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I'm I'm running Tales from the Awning Portal, right? I've changed multiple things in this book because some of the decisions were stupid. Some of them were like bad plot. Like there was some really weird like uh, isms in the first dungeon with like the kobolds versus the goblins. Got rid of that stuff, made it like clear what the tension and the conflict was about. Like you can, the, 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 the published material you use is just a foundation. Make mm. it your own. Mm. Yeah. That being I, I said, I also I because I publish myself, I'm I'm kind of dipping both toes in, right? I get to I'm straddling that line the whole time. And it's a trick question. It, you were spot on. Like you don't have to choose. I'm a big fan of Tales of the Awning Portal, too. Um I love it's good I, classic dungeons. I love that first. So I have a question. Um and I'm sorry I didn't see the, the episode one of this one, but did you did you start in the yawning portal? We did not start in the awning portal. Because I think that's a trap, yeah. That, that is a trap, but there's a, there, I made a reference to it. So uh, world building detail, the, the, the whole, the, the, my campaign world is canonically the last world, meaning mm -hmm. every D&D &D world you have ever played before has met its demise to Cthulhu as a thought. Some elder evil has come in and eaten that world. And the gods of this current world have been grabbing the last pieces and stitching them together into this plane that is just this constantly, like, when another world dies in, like, the timelines, it gets, like, like stitched into the side of the plane, and it just keeps building and building and building. So it is canonically the last world. So I started the campaign off with myself in this really weird, like, uh, video filter, and it was... Uh, I'm forgetting his name, but the proprietor of the awning portal talking to camera to the audience. And basically he's floating through space, still immortal, but like the forgotten realms, Toral has been eaten and like little scraps of it are stuck in the current uh, like home campaign. Um, but yeah, so the yawning portal makes an appearance, just not for the players or the characters. Love it. Yeah. Cause like, here's, here's this entrance to this incredibly intriguing mega dungeon. Ignore it. Hit the road. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so funny that they use it as like the framing device and then just never mention Under Mountain at all. No. You shouldn't. It's a mega dungeon. It needs its own book. They did that, but like it's very funny. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which, what, what should I do if my players want to go to this dungeon entrance that they're, you mm -hmm. got them drunk in front of? It's like, oh, buy another book and run a different campaign and throw exactly. out all your prep. <laughs> I like, I like the narrative premise that like you're talking about these dungeons yeah. in the yawning portal like you're hearing the stories of these adventures like later that's a fun little like connective thread because they didn't provide like a real plot hook connective thread through the dungeons yeah but it is a very like weird bait and switch yes <laughs> um encumbrance question mark uh i use it i don't use the variant version but i do use the like you know stay below your strength times times 30 or whatever uh and uh, otherwise you go slow Otherwise, you go slow. Which, be, which, actually, which definitely came up, actually came up while we were dungeon crawling because the, the the strength wizard was hauling around like a giant chest of their loot. So I had to like leave that behind sometimes to like go explore a room and then come back and like keep dragging it along. It, it can create interesting problems to solve. Yes, exactly. I, I'm always looking, when you look at a rule, decide, can I make this narratively interesting? And that's your real sign of like whether or not to eschew it or not. Love it. Um, favorite class, and I'll I'll accept any game because we talked about a bunch already. But ooh, oh, okay. Well, that you said it, and then you made it dif more difficult. I, I, mean, I'll, I will take your, your five point five answer, and then other is optional. Yeah, uh, I'll accept write-ins. <laughs> I'll accept write-ins. Uh, God, temptation to 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 plug is uh deep, but I will go with barbarian. I think Barbarian is probably my favorite just from like a spiritual level, if not a mechanical level. Mm. Um, love Barbarians. One of my first characters was Barbarian. Yeah, I think that's my favorite 5e. Now, if you're expanding it out to um, all games, I will say that I deeply love The Devoted from the original TSL uh, handbook. Um, the Devoted is all about 
being devoted to something. So it's like the Paladin, but put it on a CW show. Um, and one of their core tensions is like, if you, it, one of their moves is so great is that if you are smitten with someone, but you give them a reason to go like be with someone else, like if you encourage a relationship that you're, if you basically like, like if you block yourself from being with that person that you're smitten for it gives you like mechanical bonuses and xp and stuff i like i love that delicious narrative tension that the game provides where it's like i am so self-sacrificing that i will sacrifice my hopes at like a happily ever after to make sure somebody else gets it and that's that's the strength of those like i mean it's powered by the apocalypse it was like a, a narrative you don't have to go whole hog but like fun first narrative first especially if you a lot of folks watching this are pretty much in the 5e sphere primarily dabbling with those and you can bring those lessons back and just it's 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 good to shift the focus around um because that yeah that shit sounds awesome <laughs> yeah it's they're great games for learning that there is fun to be had giving your character a bad time yes more fun Way more yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, favorite lineage, species, ancestry. Oh, I I've got uh, uh my Wednesday PC is a changeling. I love changelings. I love I love messing with identity. I love that whole narrative. Very very fun for me. Changeling for sure. Nice. Um, combat as sport or combat as war. So like a balanced encounter versus like me like not even me grinder but like oh man gonna die <laughs> uh kind of cop out both i think there's, there's definitely room for i think sport most of the time mm -hmm. it, not especially in like a 5e context 90 percent of your encounters should be sport there should be that one encounter that really red weddings it a little bit and you, that, the, you, the players come out of it because what it builds is uh a healthy respect for combat where players don't feel like they shouldn't get into combat. They feel capable. They feel like they can handle most things, but they know that there's every chance that they open the door and something they're not ready for is there. And that that simmering tension, that constant second guessing, just a little bit of a hem haw, really builds to into like we are exploring the dark spaces of the world. I think it fulfills that core conceit of a heroic fantasy game where, yeah, you are heroes. You're going to be good 90% of the time. There's those times you kick in the door and you find some nasty stuff. That was a very good, like nuanced answer there. You like <laughs> you, you cut that Gordian knot uh, very adroitly. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Roll for stats, standard array, point by. Ooh, uh, roll for stats, but I, I will share my favorite way to do that, which okay. is uh, 46 drop lowest. Mm -hmm. But uh, I typically it, like make the numbers work. I usually play with like five players and a GM, so it works perfectly for a six stat system. Uh, oh. Everyone rolls one, and you share the array. I like that. And the reason I like that is I always hate the tension of player parity. I hate it when like someone's got eighty four, someone's the demigod at level one, and you're sitting there, me. You've seen my rolls so far. It's me. I'm sitting there with a 68, and it's not nice. Uh, like <laughs> We've all seen it. We've all seen it now, ladies and gentlemen. The... Yeah. And, and I my... can balance the game party versus enemies, monsters. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot a Dungeon Master can do to balance between the players. Yeah, there's Yeah. Almost nothing except literally GM fiat and just going in like, okay, you get this score. Which is, if your numbers don't add up to where you've got six people to roll for all of them, my favorite variant is with four players in the GM. You roll for five, and then the GM picks the last number. So if they if everyone rolled like gods, it's just like, cool, here's a seven. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, or you know, you can sneak in that eighteen if every if you roll That's, all the stats. <laughs> or if it's just like this really middling, like twelves and thirteens across. Okay, here's an eighteen. Like, like I want you to have fun. I want you to have an array that you're that you're interested in, that gives you a cool character to play. But I also want there to be you know highs and lows, and I also want the party to feel balanced amongst each other. That I don't want that resentment that's baking in there at the very beginning. It's just not fun. That's not fun. That's not whatever side of the that stick you're on is not mm -hmm. it gets it gets old fast um balance 
versus realism in like encounter balance. design balance very similar to the trap you're all i'm i i have not googled this i might google this right now when was the first sewer when was the first sewer ever ever made when was the first sewer yes yeah. like when, in a in like a, in a D &D dungeon or like yeah. in, like literally in real life yeah no it could i mean it went in the river that's what yeah <laughs> Like this is gutters, what I mean. I, gutters, gutters have existed for a long time. Most, most mo modern. What I'll say is like pre-industrial revolution, post-medieval period. I would say I'm not a good historian, but I would say that most of those cities did not have like complex sewer systems, and certainly none that you could go into and stand in. No. And yet, the first mission that everyone does is you go kill dire rats in the sewer. So I call shenanigans on the whole premise of realism. You are barking up the wrong tree. There are so many bad, ugly decisions that have been made in pursuit of realism, air quotes, mm. that it gets in the way. Balance is far more important. Fun is far more important. It needs to be I, believable enough to trick the audience, but nothing else. I, I begrudgingly agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm committing a sin, right? But we just look at the mess that 3.5 was in terms of like, let's arbitrate every interaction that could possibly happen. And then you still wind up in places that don't feel real. Right. You can't do that. You can't do that. Yeah. And there's magic in this world, right? Yeah, so like, yeah. Yeah, where do the, where does the poop go? Is like that's the that's the line. That's the yeah. line where it's like, oh, thought I have thought too hard about this. Mm -hmm. You know, like ecology can be very interesting if it's presented in an interesting way that the players might be able to interact with in some way. Yeah, but like, look at my baroque <laughs> ecosystem of <laughs> food chains and the the intricate water filtration systems that these guys have built nobody cares we're playing yeah. a game no one cares nobody cares <laughs> can i can i disrupt that to create some sort of rivalry between the factions and like destabilize this dungeon then like oh oh okay cool yeah I'm in, now i'm in um, exactly but, you nailed it the realism only matters if it's narrative hook the realism only matters if it serves narrative so yeah take that for what you will yeah and there's an i don't know there's news and it eats the poop don't worry about yeah. it <laughs> That's fine. Or That's why I, I genuinely wonder were Odiugs designed just to answer that question. The, that's where the poop goes, is the Odiugs. Every city has Odiugs somewhere in like the nexus points of their sewer. Yes. Love it. I think I think that's one of those like I think that was in the bag of weird Chinese minis that Arneson or Gygax had. Yeah. I think that's one yeah. of those. <laughs> but I could I could be wrong. <laughs> I love that deep cut lore of like where did these monsters come from? Just a bag of like discount action figures and he statted them up. Just absolutely fantastic. And like yeah, I just love being like that's your defense against some grognard who shows up in the old days. Like the there's a there's a in the game. This was handed down on stone tablets from on high. Nah, dude. They went no. to the dollar store. <laughs> yeah. You're you're gay. Like there's there's also just so many quotes you can see from like the old the old guard Ooh. that are like Thank you. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on swiftly. There's some old hey, if there are no ladies at your table, right? If women don't want to participate in your uh, recreational activity, um, it's possible that their brains are fundamentally different than yours. Or maybe it's you guys <laughs> maybe you're a real unfun person to be around and maybe I've... there's a because like i've been at tables that were all women except for me mm -hmm. and like god damn is that fun right it's like so good yeah i there's some <laughs> if you're if your answer is their brain's different you some maybe something's wrong with your <laughs> brain buddy what's stop pointing fingers yeah <laughs> where yeah. are we going oh man <laughs> anyway that's there that's there don't it's Come yeah. at me if you want to, but I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> hey, I, you're you're talking to someone who's running a game that uh, the entire stable cast is femme, like or at least femme presenting, and so like, yeah, I I love it. They bring a different energy to the game that you won't get otherwise. Like it's you, your tables are always going to be better if you include voices that haven't been there already. God, and this hobby, and I think I think part of it. Some like of the whatever grognard defensiveness comes from like this is the last bastion of my weirdness that like <laughs> I got pushed out onto the fringes and like I got a wedgie and shoved in a locker 40 years ago defending this space or like merely occupying this space. So like mm -hmm. what have you kids done to, to deserve this? Like, nah, man, kick those gates fucking wide open. Like, yeah, the more Absolutely. interesting fringe 
the elements that we're bringing into this, the better. I mean, the more voices, yeah, like small D democracy you're bringing into something, the better. The more ideas, the more creative energy, the better. But like, God, get doors wide open. Come on in. Let's go. Yeah. Like, I've met so many interesting people that like I would not have in my like day-to-day life through playing this game and like you know you go through some shit with these people even if it is imaginary parts of your brain don't know that <laughs> you're forming yeah. intimate Bleed relationships is real. the shit's real uh-huh. shit's real so like fuck yeah i i just i love like whatever i play in uh my local game shop on tuesday nights and like i just love looking around that room like last night it's just like mm-hmm. oh fucking everybody's here yeah. everybody's here that's great that's nice that's- it's it's the third space we need. It's the place that we come together over a shared activity and we can either forget the world outside or we could put parts of it in there, roll initiative against it and kill it together. And like that is so important for all of us that if you are policing who gets to take play, part in that activity, you're on you are not you are you do not pass the vibe check. All right. And there's a table for you, right? Like yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that inclusivity <laughs> trap of like tolerating mm-hmm. a tolerance like no just not go you can go you guys go play somewhere mm-hmm. else that's you fine. go you go to your grognard table and just don't tell us about it we'll we'll be fine over here right and it's not like i know a lot of like grognards i know a lot of people have been playing since the 80s right and like mm-hmm. most of those guys are chill as fuck i will say like i i want to when i use the word grognard i'm talking about the ones that don't pass the vibe check right I, when, when it's the when it's folks that have been here and they've got tradition they've they're been here to day one but they're doing the right things you're you're creating welcoming spaces you're using that experience to provide new opportunities for new people you're doing it right you're absolutely you are carrying the torch well yeah it's not like a it feels like it gets thrown around as like a generational tank right it's like yeah. gen x or whatever but like no grognard are the grumbly asshole veterans mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's there legit are... in the in the lexicon in the yeah in the the, the etymology of it all there are just as many millennial grognards that are like policing the vampire the masquerade spaces. And it's like you can <laughs> absolutely f off. He's naming names, guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is my dark, dark goth well, corner well, of the that's world. That's the thing is that like these stories give us opportunities to talk about some dark shit, but you got to be able to talk about it responsibly. And Vampire the Masquerade is a fantastic game that lets you talk about dark, dark, dark stuff. But if you're not willing to do it responsibly, then you are not behaving properly yeah it it provides it provides some people with an excuse yeah and i think and there's like there's the let's call it the neutral version of that like a lot of new dungeon masters sit down with like their friends their family their loved ones and like here's a fantasy world without consequences and here's a book about a story about how your heroes and your people you've known for years are like Fuck hero. I'm good. I'm lawful good in real life. I'm going to burn this world to the ground. And you're like, oh, shit. I didn't know that was something that lived inside of you. Yeah. That's a uh, different thing. <laughs> I, I I love stories that let you engage with that. It's why if I ever play like a long running PF2E campaign, I really want to try that Bloodlords campaign where you get to play in the like ruled by the undead place. Mm. And you like are trying to like work your way up the undead like hierarchy and become like rulers of this despotic land i want to see how that story goes it sounds just so interesting i'm running a kind of evil campaign like but not by design i was like oops all all assholes (laughs) (laughs) and like the and this is why you should have session zero even if you have Mm -hmm. a, a collaborative group of people who you trust and you don't have to talk about boundaries or whatever like vibe check yeah um just the campaign expectations, like what are our characters doing and why that is more than enough reason to have a session zero beyond just like safety and lines and veils and stuff. And it doesn't have to be three hours. It can be three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It can be a 10 minute Um, conversation just to check in, make sure you're all building character. You don't come. One person's not playing a pink sparkly fairy and the other person's playing a grim, dark shadow Lord. Or if you are, you at least knew this is going to be a only wacky party. Yes. And I, li- I like that. I'm here. F- I'm here for it. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of why, like, I'll, I'll, especially with this one group, I'll like throw it to the wind. But the secret is like, I don't care how evil you are. You're trying to like game the system or gain dominion or get rich and fuck everybody else. Like, if the world's over, so are you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just like a yeah. bigger big dad. <laughs> evil alignments are absolutely playable. You just have to have the right framing and you just have to structure it well. 
Yeah. And, and, and evil people fire. are incentivized to have a world that functions so they can control it. Right. Right. Uh, Mussolini made the trains run on time, right? Like mm -hmm. that's yes. There's a few ways to look at that prism. <laughs> no, no one's more organized than the Third Reich. Like you, it's yeah, like it's awful. But like when we see it every day, evil lives in systems of control. Like evil has a deep incentive to keep society around. And yeah, and the bureaucracy might actually breed evil. <laughs> you might not start with evil. You might start yeah. with systems of control. <laughs> Laws are approximations of justice. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's the map, not the territory. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite uh, third party tool? And I will I will accept two here um because you i will allow you to promote yourself because i know that's like that's kind of a double bind <laughs> so what should people check out from you and then what is your third party tool of choice uh outside of that oh oh third party tool tool okay uh i did make a crafting system if you're looking for something that's a bit more robust than what was in xanthar's guide to everything but uh not as crunchy as some of the things i've seen out there somewhere in the middle somewhere that has like a gathering system built into the crafting system mm -hmm. Uh, I have one available on my uh, itch page. It is free. It's currently marked as playtest, but you pay what you want. Go grab it. Uh, let me know what you think. Um, and then the other, the, the other third-party tool that I really, really enjoy. Hmm. There. Oh gosh. I know. But so, like, I don't know. Would uh, would like a Cobalt Press Bestiary count? Because I love their yeah. monsters. No, that's yeah, that's third-party. Okay. They're, cool. <laughs> they're a little. Uh, Janky's not the right word because they sing, but like, woo, don't trust the they, CR. Get ready dude, to pull some levers I, in the middle of one. <laughs> I saw a really interesting dev article about like why they make certain choices. And one of the things that they do that's really fascinating is they typically avoid the like saves at end of turn to remove debuffs. Instead, it's like, oh, you failed the save. It's on you for dice number many rounds. Mm -hmm. And they did that because it's like, basically it averages out to be the same and it makes sure that the debuff hangs around long enough to be relevant to the CR. I was like, that's a really good point. Um, I will also just say, I love those books because every monster gets art. And so often I'm looking at like a stat block and I'm like, all right, I want to make a token of it. I want some evocative art. I want, and then it's just that empty headless little, like the, the icon for whatever the creature type is. And I'm just sad inside. <laughs> cool. They're very well-made books. And I really appreciate being able to supplement all the other monsters I have with those. The, 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 the Tome of Beasts. Um, there, there's some good lair stuff out there too. Like, Woo, and they're just they're just fucking cool. They're, they're just cool. cool. Boy dragons are dope. Yeah, it's just di it's like different, distinctive. Mm -hmm. They're like they're doing cool thematic stuff. They look awesome. Yes. And yeah, there's something about like I'm going to read this is this is a voyage dragon. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. This here's a picture of this thing that I'm going to describe to you what this thing looks like. Ooh, very, very different level of immersion there. Very different. If I could just reveal a token on a map mm. and my players are going, oh, ah, ah, like, fantastic, we're there. We can roll initiative and we're immersed and we're having a good time. Yeah. What is this thing? Uh, roll, roll an intelligence check to see if yeah. you have any idea. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I'm not tell telling you. you. you you've, got a, you've got a thousand words right in front of your eyeballs. Look at that. <laughs> um, last stop on the lightning round. Favorite non Dungeons and Dragons game? You've mentioned quite a few tonight. Oh gosh, favorite. Okay, I'm going. To... God, there's so many. Yeah, I'll accept a list or perhaps current favorite. Okay. Uh, if you're looking for that, like rules, not rulings, OSR, NSR experience, Cyborg. It's the <laughs> it's the cyberpunk riff off of Morkborg. It is so fantastic. It is so loreful. The book is a piece of art, just like Morkborg is slash was God, i love every time i play that system i'm just smiling from ear to ear it's a joy and it's you're it's just it's like it's all of the things that are soul crushing about like a cyberpunk world but with the absolute unbridled joy of ridiculousness and outlandishness and silliness and like i have one hp and i'm about to die but let's go fire some grenades and, and bust out a bank or like take down a capitalist hellhole like I just, I just love it i love what that system does without getting in the way with a bunch of rules and then i will also just re-say again thirsty sword lesbians i i will if there's one hot take i will say until i die it's that i think 90 percent of D D games D D campaigns would be better as tsl games 
Ooh. I okay. don't think I don't think Attack of the Darkness, Monster Combat, Dungeon Delving. When you look at Dungeons and Dragons, even the 2024 book, most of your features are towards combat. It's mm-hmm. mostly towards tactical combat. It's 4E with a 3.5 like disguise on top of it. Most actual plays, most home games that I have seen amongst like what I'll call new guard players, the the current batch of people that are falling in love with these games, most of those have extended role play sessions, interpersonal drama. They have ships, they have romances, they have they have lovers to enemies, enemies to lovers. They have all like there the is Strahd hot would not be a joke if it wasn't the fact that all of you are playing thirsty sword lesbians games with way too many goddamn rules. <laughs> Play thirsty sword lesbians and you will have a much better time. I don't know. I, I, I maybe much better time is too harsh a way of saying it, but like I see scenes play out even in our own games where I'm like, I wish I could roll like emotional support right now. I wish I could roll figure out a person right now. Mm. That's the mechanical hook I'm looking for in this mm. moment. Mm. But instead I'm just in the, the wibbly wobbly realm of like persuasion and charisma and insight. And that's it. And there is some like masking reskinning that you, you can do with those buttons, right? Like here's the thing. If you're running the game, you can call it D and D and use yeah. a bunch of subsystems on your side of the table. Mm-hmm. They don't. You, they don't have. They don't, they don't know. Gotta know, baby. Especially if you got new players, they don't know what D and D looks like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, I, I, in my, in my head, there's a campaign that I really want to run, and we have a project at Tales that I might get a chance to run it. I want to run a like Gundam style, uh, like Starcross lovers, uh, like galaxy at war big mechas thing but when they're not in the mechs it's thirsty sword lesbians and when they're in the mechs it uses the mecha hack rules and just have a like a dual system campaign where depending on the context that you're in makes the rules that you're using different i look forward to that (laughs) (laughs) i hope i hope you achieve these goals i hope so too i am here for it um thank you matt for hanging out with us today check them out all over the place there's a there's a bunch of links down below uh support awesome creators uh that crafting system i could have used last night um dope actual plays all all of the right boxes checked um thank you again for hanging out with us we're gonna roll on the game master's compendium of explosive creation in a little bit of time uh until then matt what's what's coming up next i mean you just gave us a dope theoretical next campaign Mm -hmm. but like what's what what's on what's on what's on deck for matt best oh i'll say uh, for me personally i'm working on a writing project that i'm very excited about i talked a little bit about it i I did like a mechanics reveal on tiktok recently but it is a tarot card based deck builder ttrpg so you build decks of cards using tarot cards those represent what your character can do and the entire game is it's I like to say it's pillarless because we're all coming from that D and D context of like uh-huh. role play exploration combat. Mm-hmm. It's all the same. Oh, you're in a tense negotiation. It's deck versus deck. It's card dueling, and you use the values and the suits of your card to basically like play Magic the Gathering, play Yu Gi Oh, play whatever like card duelist system you're familiar with. If you've ever played Fury of Dracula, the board game, it's very similar to that pick and show style of card dueling, and uh, it is based on the idea of entering the dream world and experiencing a shared subconscious, a shared narrative that is under threat from the collective fears and anxieties and turmoil that lives in all of our hearts. And you, as awakened dreamers, must find a way to set things right, make sure that the dream world does not become corrupted to fear and that everything plunges into darkness. And every the mechanics of it are encouraging you to... I played this card. It has a mechanical result. But what does this card say? If you're used to doing tarot readings, if you're used to oracle cards, if you're used to like interpreting artwork to do like those solo journaling style games, that is in there as a mechanical hook. You get mechanical benefits for, I'm going to play this card because I think the artwork on it speaks to the situation we're in and this is how. So there are levels of where divination meets crunchy card dueling mechanics to where you are telling a collaborative surreal story using artwork and shared narrative and that surrealism stuff all to tell you know uh, a, a story that's basically playing magic the gathering but without having to 
buy too many cards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> lead with that next time. Uh, yeah. That sounds real. That sounds really uh, appealing to me. Yeah, that's that that that's yeah. right up my alley. That's very interesting. Like a, a narrative based deck mm-hmm. builder. Um, yeah. And if you would like to learn more, there is a link uh, that you could join the Discord that's linked on my website, day20.org. There's a Discord link right at the top. Join that. It is the Liches of Eternal Caffeination, which is sort of a co, like, co-discord uh, between myself and another creator, Conlon. He's one of my co-stars in Tales, and he does a fantastic job. We're making a couple of games together. That's one of them. Uh, and you can learn more in the Discord there. There are channels set up for that game called The Beckoning Dream. Phenomenal. Awesome um okay very exciting everybody home we'll check click go click all of those buttons join the discord uh <laughs> um thank you so much for watching we'll see you next time until then be kind have fun bye bye